Hello everyone, welcome once again. So now I like to call Mary from Biguna University to deliver her speech on effective and efficient medical writing on journals and publications. Over to you, Mary. Thank you, Akshay, and uh, greetings to all. <laughs> I've already met, feel like I've met some of you. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And I would like to, first of all, say greetings from Japan, because this is where I've been living for 30 years. And today, I would like to present effective and efficient medical writing for journal publication. You're probably wondering why uh, you're all prominent scientists and very well published scientists. But uh, considering that many of you may be mentoring residents or PhD students in research, and you realize that some of them might be ESL, English as a second language uh, scientist, that may need some help with publications. And it's a kind of a cutthroat world, uh, the publisher parish world of <laughs> getting, getting a paper accepted in, in international journals. Uh, let me describe a little bit about myself first. Uh, I'm an American from Midwest, basically, and I was doing allergy and immunology research at Mayo Clinic. And then I got married and moved to Japan, hence the family name Shibuya, or like the station name in Tokyo, Shibuya. Uh, after arriving in Japan, I realized that uh, compared to the research and the publications I could do in, in Minnesota, I realized that in Japan, there was a lot of excellent research going on. This is 30 years ago, but they weren't publishing in English. They were publishing a lot in Japanese, and I felt bad. I felt that the world is not seeing some of their research. So I took on, instead of research, I decided to work in Exceptomedica Publishing Company. And then after that, for 25 years, I was the English editor of the journal Internal Medicine, which is published by the Japanese Society of Internal Medicine. And I was able to also be on their editorial board. So I gained a lot of knowledge as far as both sides, the editing papers, and also what it's like to be on the, the opposite side, on the journal side. And then, <clears throat> In more recent years, I've been working also through Shoei University Medical School and graduate Guma University Graduate School of Medicine as a lecturer, visiting lecturer on writing publications, writing medical and scientific publications. So that is why I'm here today. But I also I want to give Scholars International uh, greetings and thank you because I wish to be able to spread my word that everyone should be encouraged to publish in English, no matter what their native language is. So thank you, Scholars International. As far as effective and efficient medical writing, oh, there's, there's many ways to attack the, the issue, and one is imperative shortening. And today I'll discuss ways of shortening, uh, in part in using punctual aids, but also some other added activities. So cutting or shortening, why would we want to do that? We, you know, we spent an hour working really hard on writing this lengthy paper and getting everything in from excellent introduction to all the way to discussion. However, there are reasons for cutting and shortening. And, and the main reason is to improve the clarity or readability. And why I state that is that considering your audience, all of the audience of international journals there's a very, very high percentage that they are ESL, once again, English as a second language readers. And so it's utmost important to improve clarity of our writing and to make sure it's very understandable. We want to increase the understanding not only for native English speakers, but for everyone, and also for skimming readers. And come on, you know, you all know we're all <laughs> we're all guilty of skimming, whether it's just simply an abstract or a whole paper. And for skimming readers, if they get lost, they'll just give up and they won't continue to read the paper. So it's important to keep it very clear. So 
Yes, skimming readers. Also, we want to increase the directness, and the directness means to emphasize the main point, really the main clutch of the paper. What are we aiming toward? And as far as skimming readers go, if you can't get your main point out there, they'll miss the whole point of the paper, and they'll only see a few small, small parts, questionable parts. So don't be afraid to cut. Watch out for dead weight words and phrases. That's important in any situation, in any language. Uh, for example, it should be emphasized that. Also empty words and phrases. Oh my gosh, we have basic points of important and long words and phrases that could definitely be shortened. Uh, they sound elegant and they seem, you know, so sophisticated. However, every extra word can mean less understanding by many. So how about unnecessary jargon and acronyms? I know acronyms sound so important to keep things short, but on the other hand, if there's too many acronyms, it gets too confusing for the reader. And repetitive words and phrases, and adverts that aren't so necessary, and also important point, and I realize this happens a lot in Japanese manuscripts, do not repeat the figures in the text. Rather, just briefly summarize the value of the figure. The figures can stand alone, and all you need to do is mention the results of those figures. Not all the p-value has to go in the, in the results or in the abstract, for that matter. So how else can we be effective and efficient? We can cut unnecessary components. So negative, and I know sometimes in science we need obviously need negatives too, uh, regarding terminology uh, and citations. Interestingly, citation sentences can be improved and shortened. Um, our methods, uh, of course, they have to be completely, completely be repeatable by the reader, the audience. They have to be able to replicate that study. So the methods have to be complete. However, there are ways to shorten the methods so that that way you don't need five pages of just methods. And be careful in the results, no redundancy. And so we talked about eliminating negatives. Let's look into that more seriously. Um, of course, we need to have negative sentences sometimes, but how about he was not often right? Can we simply say he was usually wrong? And it still has the same meaning, but it's just more clear and more direct. And he did not want incorrect me measurements. Of course, he wanted correct measurements, right? Instead of having two negatives in that sentence, which we sometimes, even native speakers, don't realize we're doing unless we take a look at every word. And he did not believe the treatment was harmful. So how about simply the treatment was safe? Uh, easy, fast, and understandable. And we can look at some other ways that uh, we don't exactly eliminate negatives, but we make them more clear and understandable. So false can be used, dishonest can be used, lax, lax is very important in scientific papers. We often can use lack, uh, unimportant, forgot, ignored, failed, fail, you know, un unfortunately, sometimes we have to have failures and failed studies, but those also are important to include and safe. Um, looking also at eliminating excessive uses of there are and there is. So for example, there are a lot of diabetic patients who have hypertension. Well, is it really necessary? Can we start out? Can we actually start out with the subject? How about many diabetic patients have hypertension or hypertense? So that way it's shorter to the point. And I think you can see how that it's different as far as the understanding in a real quick glance, you can get the meaning of it compared to the first sentence, the above sentence. So not only can we make these sentences shorter, but they also can become more direct and more to the point. Now, how about another example? There is an association between smoking and cancer. Let's, let's start out with a subject. Well, one or the other subject, simply smoking is associated with cancer. So that once again, shortening, but also getting it to the point. So we've looked at common rubbish, <laughs> extra things that can be cut out of your papers. It can be regarded that or as it is well known, 
it should be emphasized that as it has been shown, uh, sometimes they are necessary in a discussion section, but not always such lengthy sentences. Uh, important basic proponents of methodologic and long words and phrases that actually just could be shortened. And regarding unnecessary jargon and acronyms, well, sophisticated yet undefined scientific terms are can be confusing. And you have to keep in mind that not every single reader is going to be with your, within your definite area of expertise. They, even though it might be a cardiology journal or it might be a journal of physiology, everyone will not be a physiologist reading your paper. So you have to be careful for the overuse of jargon. Also homemade acronyms, we can't do that. It's just, it can be way too confusing and unfamiliar to readers. How about repetitive words or phrases? Mm, some of these are very overused and sometimes within the same sentence. So we have to be careful on that line also. Adverbs also can be overused to a great extent. So we just watch out when we're writing our papers. And next, we need to also think about using the active voice. And the reason to use the active voice is that it can give you the best point. Uh, if we compare with the passive voice, for example, my first visit to Boston will always be remembered by me. Hmm. Okay, that's all right. We can understand it. The English is fine. It's not incorrect. However, if we could change it around and make it an active voice sentence, it could be much easier understandable. I will always remember my first visit to Boston, which actually I will. But at any rate, you can compare the two sentences and see how the second sentence is much more easy to understand and much more direct and uh, just fewer words too. And it happens to come from strunk and white elements of style. Now let's look at another example. And this is the JSH, Japanese Society of Hypertension. A recommendation was made by JSH to monitor salt intake. Well, you know, English is fine, that's all right. But do we have to use a passive? Can we change it to active voice? Instead of a recommendation, can we have a, a active verb? How about JSH recommended to monitor salt intake. <clears throat> so other, there are other ways to revise active sentences to using active voice. And you can start out simply instead of were found because were found is <laughs> passive and it's at the end of the sentence. Start out right away with we observed and it's fine to use the active voice and first person if, if there are more more researchers than just yourself, if you have colleagues. And how about, it was concluded that the data was not correct. Well, it was concluded, who concluded? I mean, if, if you're the reader, you wonder who? So obviously we probably should include who we're speaking of. And for example, we concluded that the data was incorrect. And another interesting means of shortening is taking out any extra words that might be necessary. As we can see from figure two, if the level is less than 3.2 units, there will be two symptoms associated with this level. Okay, well, we've got level and level, and as we can see from, so can we start out, can we start out and shorten already? Figure two shows, that's fine to use it that way. Figure two shows that a level of less than 3.2 units is associated with two symptoms. Or even better, it's kind of boring to start out a sentence, especially more than one with figure two, and you always have to spell out figure, by the way, at the beginning of the sentence. Uh, but even better might be to include the figure two citation within parentheses at the end of the sentence, and uh, also use a less than mark for the less than 3.2 units. And if you can compare the top sentence and the bottom sentence, you, I think you can see how much easier it is to understand the shorter sentence. It's just so quick for us to understand that. And there's other ways to shorten. For example, strokes have been estimated to occur in 5.5 to 7.3% of the Italian population. Well, there isn't any reference and we probably should have a reference if it's been estimated. 
And also there isn't any distinct Italian population. We don't know if this is Italian adults, Italian males, we don't know. So we need to check the reference. But how about simply strokes occur in, because it's occur because it's published, so present tense, occur in 5.5 to 7.3% of Italians and then include the reference citation. And this one I think is kind of lengthy. We won't go into ingesting rice, but uh, women undertook rice ingestion. And don't turn your verbs into nouns. Try, try to keep an active verb. So for example, there's the verb is a noun in this case. Quantification of tumor necrosis factor alpha was performed using a marine TNF alpha ELISA kit from Diaclone. Well, that's all right. A sentence is fine, the English is fine. However, can we shorten it and make it easy? Can we go ahead with the subject? Can we go ahead with tumor necrosis factor alpha was quantified? Let me back up here was quantified and then using a TNF alpha ELISA kit. And then we don't even need from, we could include in parentheses diaclone and we need to include the city and the country of that company. It's always important to include that. So as a final sentence, it seems to be a little bit easier to understand and more to the point. Um, as long as ELISA enzyme link inked immunosorbent assay is, is defined above, <laughs> or that should also be defined at some point, same with tumor necrosis factor. So considering the principles of effective writing, we talked about cutting unnecessary words and phrases and using an active voice, subject, verb, object, preferably, and then to write with verbs that are strong verbs and verbs that are not nouns and please don't put the verb at the end of the sentence. The reader is waiting and waiting and waiting. So what happened? Did it increase? Did it decrease? They're just wondering what happened. So we can think about wordy versions and short versions, for example. And when you go through your manuscript, kind of just circle areas that maybe could be shortened and then go back to them and think about them. These are just some examples of of phrases that could be shortened and they're kind of tedious and it's fine in English science papers to use because we don't have to always say due to the fact that, for example. And then next we need to know about first person. Is it is it use of we and I allowed? Well, yes, it is okay. The active voice is livelier and easier to read and you or your team ran the experiments and the case study, whatever it is, and interpreted the data. So to imply otherwise is actually misleading. So experiments were done, for example. Well, because you have agreed to be an author on the paper, you should take responsibility for its content. Thus, you should use we or I in your writing. We performed the allergen challenges, for example. So journals want this. <laughs> journals even ask for it. Style guidelines for many journals instruct the authors to write in the active voice. Even Science Magazine advises that you use the active voice. And great authors have used it, we and I. So for example, Watson and Crick's 1953 paper in Nature begins, we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid, DNA. So there, way back in the 50s, already using active voice and using first person. So how are other ways that we can be effective and efficient? Well, we also need to shorten citations sometimes and figures and references. Um, for example, in this reference citation, the it's according to the method of Blobel et al. Well, if I look in the list, actually it's two authors, so it should be Blobel and Potter. And we don't need to repeat that each time. So basically we can simply say Blobel and Potter and include the date if, if that's the way the citation works, if it's not a numerical citation. So there are ways we can shorten and make, make every sentence important. So when is it okay to use the passive voice? I've spoken negatively about the passive voice. However, in the method section, we can use the passive voice. What was done is actually more important than who did it in the method section. 
And readers tend to skim the method section for keywords rather than reading it word for word. So in that sense, uh, it might be more effort to try to keep on using we and I did this and did that. So it might be better to use passive voice in the method section. Uh, let's take a minute to experiment with punctuation. They are useful friends. The colon, semicolon, and parentheses uh, can be very, very valuable tools. They can help to vary the sentence structure and shorten and uh, make other sentences important. So the colon, for example, can be used to define a partial sentence. It can be used as a list or as in a sequence, for example, in a method. And semicolon is very useful. It is used to connect two complete sentences of similar meaning or similar thought process. So the semicolon, as I mentioned, two complete sentences. So this is an example, recent investigations further support a role for inflammation and diabetes. And then to use a semicolon there, several studies have demonstrated elevated levels of CRP, C-reactive protein. So in this sense, it's easy for the reader to just connect instead of a full stop period. They can continue, continue reading and think it's connected. And colons, I guess we're running low on time, so I, I won't go through colons as much. Um, colons are used in titles, as you all know, and also can be used in lists and very e useful in lists, uh, but be careful not to make your list too long. Parentheses are also very useful because it can insert an afterthought or an explanation or simply word or phrase that is fine in the sentence, even without it, it's fine. You don't need to have it. So if you remove the words in parentheses, just practice this, the main sentence remains the same. Just make sure the main sentence basically remains the same. It's just extra, extra material. So parentheses give the reader kind of permission to kind of skip over the material. And I will skip over this, getting too long. Um, Another important punctuation is hyphens, and we have to be very careful with, with dates and days, uh, 26 day, 26 days of, and 26th day. We have to be careful how we're using uh, our hyphens, in this case, as additive. So what are some things that can lead to publication errors? Well, misspelling, exclusion, sloppy writing of the methods, uh, lacking details so the readers cannot reproduce the study. We have to be very careful on that in our methods section. And also, we really have to check for revision, uh, misspelling, typos, uh, exclusion of facts, sloppy writing of the methods. The bottom line can be rejection. Um, so many papers are rejected and obviously some are accepted for revision, but you do have to be careful to revise according to what the reviewers asked for. And regarding revision, uh, spell check isn't always the answer to misspelling, uh, especially in tables and figures, obviously, but there are some unbelievable errors. And for example, lumber and lumber, they're both English words, but uh, we better not have a lumber spine. <laughs> so have to be careful on, uh, don't always believe your spell check. And I think I'll pass on that, but paragraph tips are one paragraph should be one idea and try to give away the punchline early, have a topic sentence in your paragraph. And shorter paragraphs are best, but uh, not, not shorter than three sentences. It would make the paper look very choppy when it's printed, even online publication, it would be too choppy. However, we don't wanna have lengthy paragraphs because they are tiring. And a good rule is uh, actually no longer than one PC string screen for a paragraph. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's one way to think about. And quick revision checklist. And the, the idea is act like a reviewer when you're going through your revision. Think, think like a reviewer would and glance to spot check everything. And that I will conclude with happy writing and thank you for your kind attention. And also, um, please come to Japan sometime and uh, 
Scholars International was here back in 2019 in Narita. And uh, we could enjoy some of the temples in Narita and not too far from the airport, uh, easy access. So thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Mary, for sharing your wonderful slides.